and all this stuff. Okay. Okay. Hello, everybody. Nice to have you all with us again in this next session of our MOOC called New School Creation. We have a crew with us tonight. My name is Larry Rosenstock. I am sitting in Seattle right now. And uh, first, I'm going to introduce uh, Bo from, from the fine city of Boston, Dan Wise. Dan, would you please introduce yourself? Sure. So my name is Dan. I currently work at Tufts University's Center for Engineering, Education, and Outreach, which, um, in addition to being a mouthful, does a lot of work around um, studying and reforming engineering education and training teachers to be able to do it well. And um, a lot of the philosophy of the place really aligns with High Tech High and its vision. So I'm also representing as a former High Tech High teacher. So um, okay. I will be happy to speak about the bonanza and anything else. Okay, good. And then Lillian Sue next up. Uh, my name is Lillian Sue. I am the school director at High Tech High Chula Vista, which is our southernmost campus, just a few miles away from the Mexican border. And uh, director is another word for principal here at High Tech High. Um, I'm also a former school leadership resident with the Graduate School of Education here and a former teacher in Oakland, California. Great. And Melissa Agudelo. Hi, my name is Melissa. I currently serve as dean of students at High Tech High um, Media Arts. I have had the pleasure of having been a classroom teacher um, in sort of regular non-charter schools for quite for about 13 years, and then I spent a few years in the classroom at High Tech High before moving into um, being the dean. Right. And Isaac Jones. Hi there, my name is Isaac Jones. I'm the director here at High Tech High North County, which is in San Marcos, California. We're about half hour, 45 minutes north of San Diego. Um, before joining the staff here in North County. I was um, a chemistry and math teacher at High Tech High in Point Loma, and before that I taught many years in New York City. Great. Okay, thanks. And, and Patrick Urich, our Master of Technology, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Patrick Urich. I am the co-instructor with Larry Rosenstock of the New School Creation MOOC, um, and I am sitting in my house in sunny San Diego. <laughs> okay, great. All right, so I am going to uh, uh, begin with a few questions that you've all asked, and we're going to spend some time with them, and then we will perhaps have some other uh, uh, looser conversations uh, amongst ourselves, and uh, we're going to go as long as it takes. It will probably be less than an hour. For those of you who are in totally different time zones in the middle of the night, that's what you can anticipate. The first question comes from Tony Hemming in Charlotte, North Carolina. Thank you, Tony, for sending this. And it is, what do you think about hiring teachers who are excited and committed to your vision, but whose work has always been at schools that don't employ similar pedagogy? Can old dogs learn new tricks? Well, I certainly hope old dogs can learn new tricks personally. And most people, of course, do come from schools that have a different pedagogy than we do. And there's Steve Elizondo. So while you are, so those of you uh, on the group already, will you uh, consider your answer to that question? A very, very good one from Tony in North Carolina. And Steve, you've joined us. Up. Oh. Okay. Uh, he he pressed the wrong button. He'll. Oh, there he is. Okay. Good. Uh -huh. Hey, Steve. Would you introduce yourself? Hey, how you yourself? doing, Larry? Hi, everybody. Steve Elizondo from High Tech Middle Media Arts. Okay. Very good. <laughs> good. Right. Okay. And that, and that question is actually from Tom, Larry. From that New was Hampshire. from that was from Tom. Oh, excuse yeah. me. That was from Tom. Okay. Then I. That's right. Didn't have a name on it. I'm very sorry about that. Okay. So, who wants to talk about this question? About you know, obviously. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna get going, and I'm, I'm gonna look for a signal for from any of you if you want to go. Melissa, did you did I see you signaling or not? Sure, yeah. I mean, but you go yeah. ahead. I'll go after well, you. I'll just say this. I mean, one thing that we think about, some people come to a bonanza, which you're going to hear a lot about, which is the process, and I hopefully everybody at this uh, on our panel here will mention what the bonanza means to them. But sometimes people will go to our website before they come in for an interview, and they'll mimic some of the words, you know, that we like to hear, um, and uh, about, you know, I won't, you know, uh, constructivism, you know, uh, deeper learning uh, projects, whatever that might be, 
and and yet you were trying to really know whether they actually have a more deeper understanding of what that's about. And a lot of them, to answer Tom's question, may or may not. Okay, Melissa, that's my intro. Um, I, as an old dog who had to come in and learn some new tricks, I, I think that uh, there's no doubt that it's very possible. I, I think there's a there's a, a lot of teachers who have worked within traditional systems who are looking for something different, and that doesn't mean that we come in with all of the skills. And often, um, I found that I had to spend a lot of time unlearning what I had already learned or what I already thought was inherent to the classroom. Um, but I was lucky that I felt that uh, my director, uh, Kelly Wilson, who was my director at High Tech High International, was very patient with me and spent a lot of time asking good questions that got me to think about things differently. And I think that was for me, as well as for other teachers I know that have come from the outside, a uh, key. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I, well. I can chime in as well. Please. Over here. I, I, did, I missed the, the signal to give if you wanted to speak. Just do what you just, just jump right in as the jump signal. In. Just, okay, yep. sounds good. So, you know, my. Initial reaction to that is what we're really looking for, just like I feel like great schools are looking for, is we're looking for great teachers. And I, and I really feel, and I feel like I can speak for our staff when I say we really feel that if, it's a great, if we find great teachers, they will become great PBL teachers. Teachers who can, can really connect with students and teach students well, even if it's in a traditional environment, can, and, and have the motivation and desire to learn uh, you know, a different pedagogy will eventually become great PBL teachers. So we're really just looking for really strong teachers who can connect with students and are motivated to grow. And I just want to add, because we have an international audience, PBL is project-based learning. Okay. Is there someone else who'd like to talk? Uh, Lillian. Yeah, I wanted to jump in and just talk about the professional development piece because I think that it's also on us as school leaders to give our teachers, especially those coming in from more traditional environments, a chance to experience the type of learning that we want them to create in their own classrooms. So one thing that we do here at High Tech High um, as part of our new teacher training, which we call the Odyssey, is something that we call the Project Slice. And essentially, it's the first day that teachers join our organization, we give them a chance to experience a slice of a project, so um, condensing in miniature all that we want our students to experience over the course of several months or over the course of a semester, we give our teachers a chance to step into the shoes of the learner and to experience that themselves. And so that day consists of opportunities to really learn through dialogue, through discussion. It involves field experiences, out meeting experts in the community. It involves uh, the teachers working together on a collaborative project and then getting feedback on that project and presenting it. So I think that as school leaders, one way we can work with teachers who who are coming from more traditional environments is to reignite their passion for other pedagogies and to model those so that they can bring those back to their classrooms. Okay, thank you. Anyone else on that one? I think, I, I'll just say most of us have, 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 I've worked in very traditional schools before. I think that al you, almost everybody here has. Dan, you have, right? What was your transition like, Dan? It was um, it was tough but interesting. I think my what I would add to this is that high tech high everyone constantly reinventing what they do and how they do it. It is a place where you won't see the same teacher teaching the same thing for twenty years. So I think that kind of um, as Larry says, churning creates an environment in which everybody is a bit off off guard. But there is there's a more collaborative and fluid process to learning how to teach. So it was nice to kind of come in midstream and meet people who, even though they've been at the school, are really thinking all the time about new ideas and how to change up what they do. Okay, very good. And Steve, you you know, Steve, I'm really glad that you put headphones on because we everyone who's watching this can see this like 20 sets of headphones right <laughs> behind you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Is there anyone else who wants to chime in on that? Steve, were you going to say something about that, about hiring teachers in that way? Or are you passing on that? I'm going to pass on that for now because I did run off to locate my headphones. Okay, so you missed I, it. Yeah, go ahead, Patrick. Well, I was going to say that I think there's a definite learning process that goes along with, um, with, with coming in as a teacher at high tech that's really difficult to get from any kind of hiring, uh, hiring process that you're going to go through. Um, even in just, I remember I had a lot of problems with the discipline model because in a, in a public school, 
um, you know, you're you're in a classroom isolated by yourself, and there's an intercom system, and you send when a kid misbehaves, you send them to the office, and they get a detention, or they get a pink slip, and they get written up, and that just doesn't happen here. We don't have intercoms in our classroom, so there was a there was a big learning process where, um, you know, my director would have conversations with me early on about like that, that's not how we deal with problems. How do you deal with problems as they come up in your classroom so that the student doesn't feel ostracized from the community and alienated from the community? Because um, we don't kick kids out of our classroom. Um, and I thought that was a, 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 an, an amazing revelation uh, that, that I went through. Um, but it took me several months to unlearn all of the regular public school concepts. And, and I'd like to add something. Um, um, about what it was like in the very beginning when we first opened the school. This, what I'm about to describe for those of you who are starting new schools is something that, like this. You'll experience this in the beginning, but it will tend to fade away, and that is parents who said, uh, but this isn't what schools are like. And I'd say, right. <laughs> you know, um, we're, we're, challenging. we're challenging a lot of those assumptions about what about what schools are really supposed to be about. And I've often walked them through their own experience in high school in which they've come to a place where they describe it as being somewhat fragmented and a little bit alienating, and then say, but I still think I want that for my kids, you know. <laughs> and then what happens, we had in the beginning a lot of people who said, but my kids love coming so much. So he said, well, that, that's a good thing, right? I mean, what's wrong with that, right? So people, so per parents are another set of adults who I think are making the same type of adjustment um, that, that Tom is getting to in this very good question. Isaac, did you want to say something? Yeah, the, the thing I would add to it um, is, one is, you brought up the point that many of us have, have public school have traditional public school experience. If you were to look across our organization, many, many people have experience um, in schools outside of High Tech High. Um, I think Lillian brings up a really good point of then supporting those teachers who are coming from other places all along the first year and then continuing to support them um, as they grow in their practice. Um, I, think, uh, I think the one thing I would say um, about that move from the traditional classroom to a PBL classroom is it can be, I remember speaking very clearly to a, to a high tech high teacher and she said, "This I've been teaching now for 10 years in a public school, in a traditional public school, and it was by far my most challenging year, my first year here in a PBL school. Um, but it was challenging in a really wonderful, wonderful way where I was challenging myself the kids were challenging me in terms of um, uh, in terms of pushing my practice, and so I think that that um, people who are coming from the outside need to be ready and wanting that challenge. Right. Okay, that's that's a great point. Thank you so much. All right, I'm going to go to now. I'm going to go to Tony Hemmings' question from Charlotte, North Carolina, and that is the following: As a small startup charter high school of 200 with 400 capacity. Our first year staff will be quite small. School director, two full-time equivalent master teachers, six full-time equivalent, and two part-time equivalent teachers. Um, I'm intrigued by the quote, bonanza method. How would you do this for a new school? So Tony, thank you for that. And we're going to be talking a lot about the bonanza uh, in the time that we have remaining. Who wants to give the bare bones description first off of the Bonanza process? I can take that one. Okay. Hey, so Thank you. Uh, basically the Bonanza process is we uh, scour through our database uh, where applicants apply and give their cover letter, uh, produce their cover letters and resumes and directors and other school leaders scour through them and basically pick out the ones that, that we think uh, seem to be a possible good fit for the high-tech schools. And then we will often do uh, phone interviews, followed up by an in-person interview. And if that teacher se still seems like a possible uh, suitable candidate for our schools, we will invite uh, that teacher in along with anywhere from, say, three to 12 other teachers to come in on the same day 
and teach uh, hour-long lessons in some of the different classrooms in our schools and also be interviewed by uh, groups of and individual teachers and groups of uh, students. And then uh, at the end of the day, pretty long day, at the end of the day we compare notes and have some discussions about, uh, again, who we think might, might, might be a good fit for our schools. Um, in addition to what I mentioned, uh, we have breakfast and, and lunch time where teachers can come uh, when they have a little break and mingle with those the teaching candidates. So we try to get as full a picture as possible in, uh, in one day. Okay, before anybody else jumps in, Steve, what about the contribution since you're running a middle school, uh, what about middle school students' contributions during those bonanzas and, and the benefit of them or lack thereof or the validity of them? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think that they certainly are valid. Uh, and they're valid for a couple reasons. One is just, I just feel like kids have such a good innate sense of who really cares uh, and who they can connect with. And so students, that's, that's one of the first things they talk about. Like, I feel like I could connect with this person. I feel like this person, uh, I'd be able to tell this person some things that I'm having some struggles with. Uh, and that's, that's a really nice indicator. And then secondly, it gives our students a really good uh, chance to be leaders because it is a leadership opportunity for students. And students step up and they feel really proud of be, being a part of that process. Okay. So it's really, it's really twofold. Thanks. And, so I see benefit and they have some, some strong insights. Melissa, do I see you there, ready to jump in? I can't hear you. Melissa, you're muted. You're muted, Melissa. Oh, so she can't hear us because you know she's... Oh, okay. oh, there you go. Oh, okay, very good. good. No, I, I didn't have anything else to add. I was just leaning back. Oh, okay, good. Okay, does anybody else want to say anything about the Bonanza? Dan, you went through one. Yes, uh, and I can talk a lot about it. Um, one thing that I think is interesting when you ask about middle school students is I think some people fear with the bonanza that when you ask students it's going to be a popularity contest, um, that, that they'll choose a teacher who they like but not necessarily one who will be good for them. And, and I found the opposite, actually. Like I've been surprised seeing this process both at High Tech High End and my former school where we did something similar, how often the kids will sniff out people who may be you know, trying to be sort of friendly with them or, or – basically someone who seems to have no substance um, in terms of teaching them. So I would just add that regardless of age, I found the kids have been pretty good about choosing good teachers. Larry, you're looking confused. No, no, no. I'm not, I'm not looking confused. <laughs> no, I'm not looking confused. I'm the guy who has to read the next question ahead of oh, okay. Me. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, anything else about it? Someone want to say something about the 4321 process in the Bonanza? Hearing, seeing no one, I will. Isaac, okay. are you poised to do it? No? Um, I mean, I could talk about the debrief. Um, okay, go ahead. Talk about the debrief. So, so as Steve suggested, um, right, there are these major components throughout the day, right, um, that include a demo lesson, interviews with students, interviews with teachers. Um, a lot of times we'll also ask um, uh, candidates to even read an article and then discuss that article together or to have like a project planning session. Um, and so at the end of the day after we, um, I'll say, release the prospective candidates, um, we all get together and we get together as a group, right, um, a staff, and we bring um, uh, all kinds of feedback forms. So feedback forms from teachers, feedback forms from students that have then interviewed the candidates. We get together as a group and then we'll debrief. So we'll talk about the strengths and weaknesses of each of the different candidates. And, Larry, uh, yes, oh, go ahead, I Lillian. just want to add one piece about the article discussion because I think there's two reasons I find that so valuable. Uh, the piece that we've generally used as that, uh, as that end of the day article discussion is Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack by Peggy McIntosh. And I think it gets at a lot of the core values that we believe in as a school in terms of questions around equity and social justice. And I think that a lot of times those pieces don't naturally come up in the course of the interview process. So having that deliberately carved out space where candidates are having that 
that conversation explicitly, I think really helps with that piece. Um, but the other part is also just looking at the social dynamics of what happens in those discussions because we are such a collaborative environment and dialogue is such an important part of the way we work with each other. I think seeing how candidates listen to each other and are able to be responsive and um, look at issues with nuance and perspective, I think that part is also a really crucial part of the Bonanza Day. Very helpful. And also, you know, we have a saying, uh, hire for disposition, train for skill. And this question of training for skill addresses what a, a lot of these questions are at about what about people like all of us who come from traditional environments. We all even went to school in traditional environments for the most part, and then we're working in a very different one now. And, and what hire for disposition means is essentially um, that, if, to me, in my own words, is that if you don't have a sense of social class justice kind of embedded in you, um, that's going to be a lot harder for us than your ability uh, to provide you with that, than to, than to provide you with a, with a context and, and support for teaching in an environment like this. Um, that Because we, we live in a society which mispredicts based on gender, race, ethnicity, um, uh, um, social class status, um, um, standardized test scores by any measure possible and we really would be not interested in somebody who thought that that was a good idea okay and so that so we're trying that is, that is something I I feel that we're trying to find out early on and are less concerned about what type of environment uh, they taught in before anyone else on that one okay so we've sort of covered it okay now the next question is uh, and now I see you're right, uh, Patrick. That was Stephen's question I asked before from Qualicom Beach early on, okay, which is about this question of, of uh, people coming from different environments. Okay, now, um, I've got a question here about uh, from, who is this from? Excuse me, I, this all came to me backwards, so it's really been quite quite a little process here. This is from um, Jared uh, Kuslich in San Francisco, California, nearby. Um, what do you think of distributed leadership models, uh, parents, teacher-led schools? Um, what do we think about um, the opportunity that we have to give people a, a, an opportunity to, to, to improve themselves? Oh, I, missed it. I messed it up again. That's Tom from New Hampshire. Please. What do you think about distributed leadership models, teacher-led schools? Okay, well... I'm gonna go for seeing no one. Okay, so this, since we, since we, since um, I played a pivotal role in arranging our schools in such a way that we have a director um, who is responsible for the school, and the director has is the only person who has higher fire authority within their school. So one question that you would have in a teacher-led school would be how would it be when somebody would be not working out and frankly would be happier working in a different environment. It's, it would, I, think for, for, I think it's difficult for a group to reach that decision, more difficult than for an individual to. I also think if I were such a teacher who was not invited back the next year, it would be easier for me to sort of blame one person who I thought didn't understand me than it would be to know that everyone voted me off the ship, so to speak, in a teacher-run school. So in a way, it seems almost, in a way, it's a little bit less democratic uh, in certain ways to have a, a very, very flat organizational chart. The other thing that happens, uh, in my opinion, I mean, there's some risks to it. And the other thing that happens is that the directors themselves don't work in autonomous isolation. But they work and support each other just as we see several leaders here today um, on this MOOC. We meet um, on Monday mornings, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of, um, of uh, sort of collegial collaboration in how we do things. But does anyone else want to talk to – maybe someone thinks that teacher-led schools – we do have a lot of teacher participation in leadership. Mm -hmm. um, does someone want to discuss that, or 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 take a different position than I do? Maybe she thinks that we should have teacher-led schools. Yeah, I'll address that. Uh, yeah. So, drawing really from what you said uh, near the end there about the, the additional 
teacher leadership opportunities, um, that's where I feel like uh, we can strengthen our schools is by providing, and we do try to do that at, at all of our schools, I feel like, providing additional opportunities for leadership. Um, an example would be in this coming year, uh, our school, High Tech Middle Media Arts, and I know some of the other schools because I've talked to some of the other directors as well, are really trying to get some of our uh, current teachers to act as um, like a common core coordinator. So they stay in the classroom, but then we hire someone else to be able to provide some release time for them to step out of the classroom, to delve into some common core in math and in English language arts, and then to, uh, and to really do some training and development with the, with the other teachers in their departments. I feel like that's just that's one example of a, of a way to give teachers um, some additional leadership opportunities. Okay. And of course, our teachers work in teams, which is can't be mentioned enough. You're not, you're not. It's not like the schools that I have gone to and worked in, where the teachers teach in autonomous isolation. Anybody else on that one? Yeah, I would just, I would just bring up that we, we do have lots of opportunities for teacher, um, for teacher leadership, um, and um, many decisions at our schools are right um, led by teachers. So things. Um, like the calendar, things like PD, things, many, many aspects of our school are very much teacher run. Um, and I, I think many of those teachers have actually now gone through kind of our graduate school of education in either the teacher leadership or the school leadership programs. And so I think there are huge um, supports in terms of leaderships amongst our teachers. Okay. Good. Yeah, and I was I was gonna say be, uh, the before we started uh, we talked about things that we don't do as teachers like um, we don't have say on like spending um, administrative spending and we and we don't have executive call on hiring and firing but um, and I I was a, I'm a big fan of the Summerhill School and like the the freedom education movement and and I really like that democracy disbursement model but. Then again, at High Tech High, because we're not spending a lot of time conducting community meetings, we're actually uh, focusing on projects that we're doing. As to, it frees up our time to focus on kind of the amazing work that we're doing with our students, as opposed to trying to come to consensus. Um, there's somebody there to make that call at the end of the day, and and that's actually proven to work better and faster and more efficiently for us to focus on the education portion. Okay, next one. No one else there. Okay, good. Videos. This is from um, uh, Andrea Fanjoy in Toronto, Ontario. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, videos and readings have provided many examples at the secondary level. What differences would we see in the high tech high junior and middle schools? Are any traditional practices and tools used? Books, textbooks, direct instruction, ability groups? How are they used if they are used? That's from Andrea. And I think we should go to oh, Steve Elizondo, just if you may, since you are in a middle school. Um, is there something different about what you do than the high schools that are around you in our organization? Um, I'm not entirely positive about that, but I do think what struck me about that question was thinking about, I feel like as a middle school, and certainly in the, in the high-tech elementary schools as well, uh, just ensuring that we are doing quite a lot of skill building um, because I know certainly at, at elementary, middle, and high, students um, really delving deeply into projects is what we're, is what we're all about and, and we really do believe that that is a strong way and for kids to learn and, and learn a lot and, and retain their knowledge. And we need to make sure that we're, we're also doing, doing quite a lot of skill building um, in the process. So. Um, as far as the question, you know, some of the things that came up were direct instruction. Well, that happens at all of our schools, you know, at times. Um, not textbooks, but certainly books. We're reading a lot of books. Um, so some of the things that we're doing look similar to, to traditional schools, but, but um, ultimately what we're doing is, is everything is, really everything that we're doing is going towards and is part of a, a bigger project. Uh, so that, that's the main difference. But um, as far as middle versus high school, perhaps a little bit more direct instruction skill building, I would say. Okay, good. Um, anyone else see any differences between them? I mean, you know, there, there, is, there is some complications with high schools that elementary schools don't have, of course, like uh, 
transcripts for college and SAT and ACT exams, and um, and and what we actually sometimes that leads to a little bit more traditional stuff um, right there, you know, um, at that at at the high school point, then the then the middle school point because there's some things that we have to do uh, to prepare kids for college admission. Lillian, uh, Dan? Well, I was just going to say, as somebody whose experience is mostly with high school, and this year has been working mostly with elementary, it's been interesting to see the differences in that elementary, in a lot of ways, is more, teachers are more predisposed to be interdisciplinary. So that's something that's actually been an advantage in um, promoting project-based work, that they all view themselves as English teachers and math teachers and science teachers and all. So I just want to raise that as one thing. The other thing is, and Steve pretty much said this, we do have you know, we do have traditional practices. They just don't dominate the curriculum in the same way that the other ones do. Um, so when we do it, we, you know, there is this sense, even back to the question of transition, this was the first school I was ever at where people really said, why are you doing that? And if the answer was, well, it's school, and that's what we do in school, then there was a sense that you were free to ignore that rationale, that if you're doing it because it's a good idea and it's at the service of the kid, that's a much different thing than this is what school feels like. Okay. Onward. Okay, good. Here we go. This is from Katarina from the Netherlands, who, who's a, a great question asker every week. A couple of questions. The first is, if I remember it correctly, some senior students are teaching younger students. What training mentorship do you provide for them? I'll begin and hope someone else jumps in. What We don't have them teaching younger students in a formal sense. Uh, however, we do have a lot of books that have been written and, and activities that have been done by upper level students that have been designed for an audience that was, that was younger children. And we've also had a lot of younger children come through our high schools to see the work that older students have done and have had conversations with them about the work. So, so in terms of the relationship of exhibition of projects, yes, I've seen a lot of that happening where, where, where older students are explaining their work and younger students are looking as something to look forward to um, and expect when they reach um, an older grade. But other than that, there's nothing really, is there anything formal that I'm missing anybody else want to mention? Yes, Lillian. So I wouldn't say it's necessarily formal, but a lot of our, because our elementary school is right next door, a lot of our high school teachers actually will do collaborative projects with mm -hmm. the elementary folks. So we have one ninth grade physics class right now that actually has a group of first graders who are their clients, and they are designing night lights for the kindergartners. And so they're working together in terms of having an authentic audience um, from the student's perspective in terms of just uh, um, working together across the grade levels. We also have had 12th grade students students work with younger students on writing poetry and helping the students critique the poetry. So I think there's a lot of cross-grade level collaborations, but not necessarily that formal training piece. Okay, very good. All right. Steve. 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 Oh, oh, Isaac and then Steve. Yep. I would, I would echo that same thing. We had a, a group of 11th graders that was out actually the, the lagoon um, this afternoon with kindergartners doing a, a, a project together. Um, and in addition to the kids working together, also the teachers will, will cross-collaborate. So we have a project tune between high school teachers and elementary school teachers going on tomorrow as well. Okay, very good. Steve? Uh, just an itch, Larry. Okay, okay, just an itch. Okay, those count. Okay, another one um, from, from Katarina in the Netherlands. Uh, again, thank you. How... How do you stimulate teachers to keep on innovating their teaching practice, which is a really great question. We're going to be talking, uh, we have one, one more question after this, and we're about halfway done, and what we're going to go into in the latter half, or less than half, is going to be descrip descriptions of some of the processes and protocols that we go through. One of the things that, that I really like about project uh, tunings in particular is the supposition that you're not doing the same thing every year. That's why you have to have a tuning. There's an underlying uh, notion that you're, that you're not, as they say, you know, repeat, have 20 years of experience where you repeated the first year 19 times. Uh, the other thing about it 
um, sometimes when we're doing a project tuning, I feel that there's another issue, which is not just tuning the proposed project is something that should have preceded that, which is the incubation of the project in the first place, because you might be tuning something that's not really worthy of being tuned. So um, does someone else want to talk about this question of, of, of teachers refreshing themselves and keeping their practice alive? Yeah, I'd like to speak to that. You know, when you asked that question, it, it immediately made me think that that goes back all the way to the hiring process, I feel like. Uh, and again, really trying to hire high quality teachers, teachers who are just not going to be, um, really not going to be happy until they're continually pushing themselves. So uh, obviously a lot of our teachers are teaching really great projects and they're the ones who are continually wanting to make it better and better and better. So I feel like so much of that innovation comes from within, that fire from within. And if we can do a good job of hiring and trying to find those people who, who really think like that and want to continue to push themselves, that's huge. And then what you said, Larry, about the, the project tunings, um, that's a great way for other teachers to see other projects. And because we have, we're really fortunate as, a, as an organization to have such, um, so many great, brilliant teachers that we're seeing their work, and then that fires us up and motivates us to, to do some, to push ourselves also. And a lot of times we'll draw from uh, different ideas from different teachers within our school, um, definitely hear about uh, projects going on at other schools that can inspire us to do some similar work and do some collaboration across schools. Uh, but again, ultimately, just to restate my initial point, just about you really have to we really have to find those teachers who have that fire within to to want to continue to innovate and continue to, continue to get better. And that's why the walls of our schools look like artifactoriums of all these great collections of what went before that was done by other students. Um, so okay, I, I see that Melissa is poised, and then Lillian. Uh my first thought also went to the hiring process and I did also think about the fact that we like any other school and like any other profession certainly have teachers who have been with us for for quite a few years and who find themselves perhaps getting stale within what they do as well and I think there's a couple things that help to answer that I think um, number one the partnering process often um, teachers that end up with new partners or perhaps work with a partner that can help push them or, or continue to try to, to work through iterations and then I do think it's also part of the teacher coaching which Lillian spoke to you know, having directors that are uh, present within classrooms and that are pushing teachers, um, even when we, any, just like any other human being, get to those points of complacency or, or you know, feeling a little bit uh, tired. Because just like any other profession or any other teaching job, it's tiring to work in a project-based environment. Mm -hmm. Great. Lillian? Um, I would also add that just giving teachers constant opportunities to step into the shoes of learners is so helpful. I think that um, this, we always have a staff retreat before students come back in, in August. And one thing we tried just recently was a 24-hour challenge where our teachers had the chance. We put them into groups the way that we would with students. And they had a chance to go and visit different nonprofits in the community. And they had to work collaboratively to design a project that would help advance the mission of that nonprofit organization. So I think just putting teachers in situations that they might not necessarily go to on their own and the same way that we would with our students and giving them opportunities to do field experiences and to collaborate together in unconventional ways. I think that always freshens up their practice as well. Great. Okay. And and while we're while we're on this, Lillian, we why don't we say we were going to talk a little bit more about you know the 24-hour challenge and and the slice and some of the uh, and then I'd like someone and, and I'll say something too about the power of public exhibitions and having families and neighbors come in on a regular basis. Will you, will you kick us off, Lillian, with that about the slice and the 24-hour challenge, please? Sure. I think with, with the slice and the 24-hour challenge, all of these things are just basically um, embodying that ethos that the way that we want to teach students should be the way that we're teaching our adults. And so the same way that we wouldn't just lecture our teachers and kind of put them in front of direct, I'm sorry, our students and want them to just sit through a lot of direct instruction, what we want is them being out in the field, connecting with experts in the community, designing authentic projects, doing critique and getting feedback. Those are the things that we want our, our teachers experiencing as well. So all of our new teachers who come through our organization go through a one-week new teacher odyssey. And during that time, you know, the first piece is always that experiential piece because I think that having the teachers go through those aha moments themselves where they realize, ah, that's why we use these practices. That's why we're not just working in our solitary, at our solitary desk 
trust, but we're working in collaboration. That's why we learn through constructing our knowledge through dialogue. By giving them a taste of that themselves, then they carry that with them when they go back to their classrooms. And we actually see a lot of those practices translating back to the work that they're doing with their students. Okay. Isaac, anyone else? No? Oh, Isaac, your keystroke it got you got you a high lit here. That's how oh, it was. Okay, good. Okay, um, then as we're sort of winding down, um, I think that we have a question that's kind of a, a curious question from Dan in Philadelphia. How does an undeniably exciting pedagogy of increased student autonomy and inquiry mesh with our increasingly litigious society? Sure, seems like rigid and clearly defined policies are increasingly the administrative fallback position these days. Well, obviously um, we're, our society is not only litigious, it's, it's actually become more dangerous in a lot of ways because I, um, I think it's a sacred public trust to have people entrust their babies with you. So we take that, we take that really very, very seriously. The ways that, that for me, that we justify uh, that what we're doing, although it's differently, is basically safe. One is that the kids are happy and thriving, frankly, and the parents know it. Our attend, our average, uh, our daily attendance rates are you know 97, 98 percent in our schools, for example, which is fairly high. Um, we and then for for those of us who really came from the high school level, we knew that we were going to be challenged, Dan, and we felt that. The, the justification that we were going to give would be the college completion rate of our graduates. Now, some people say that everybody everybody doesn't need to go to college, you know, and basically, um, well, the, the people who are saying that are never talking about their own children, first of all, but, but our hypothesis has been that even those kids who might not go to college are better served if they're not segregated from those who are and they're in programs that prepare them and expect them so that they might be. And by subgroup of black, brown, white, Asian, and, um, and, and free and reduced lunch, which for those from other countries, that is the indicator of poverty that we have in the United States, our college entering and completion rates are actually, for this sector, are really rather high. So, um, so from a parent's point of view, who might be anxious about this because it's not the way they went to school. In the early going, they know that their kid likes coming, and then the latter going, they realize that colleges like taking them. So that has given us a little bit of breathing room from a lot of what you describe as the uh, increasingly administrative fallback position these days. I think that the fallback position is taken by a lot of educators as an excuse for, for not doing things rather than a, a, as a true justification for not doing it. Is there anybody else who wants to jump in on that question and or any other question while we're here because we're going to start to wind down. So we're going to have, an, I want to say something about exhibitions then um, because people have asked some questions about new teacher preparation and, and what it's like making the transition. I think that the exhibition is very important because if I am a new teacher and we have these nights where hundreds and sometimes thousands of people come, parents, uncles, aunts, neighbors, cousins, and, and, and I'm standing there with my students and their work and everyone's looking at Dan's class's work and everyone's looking at Lillian's class's work and everyone's looking at Melissa's class's work and everyone's looking at Steve's class's work and everyone's looking at Patrick's class's work and they're not really, you know, that impressed with my class work. You just have this experience of just just like um, like the way they measure museum use is like wear and tear on the carpets before exhibits and, and, and kids museums and smudges on the glass by kids hands. If you come in and you're doing something and it's not getting that much attention, there's something within us all that wants to get that kind of attention and so instead of working alone in a room, all of a sudden that which you're doing is being made plain and being made public to others so you can't really hide and that makes you kind of want to say as I would I like what Dan's doing, I like what Lillian's doing, I like what Melissa's doing, I like what Isaac's doing, I like what Steve's doing, I like what Patrick's doing next time, next project, I'm going to do mine better so it looks more like what they were doing 
Anyone else on the any other yeah, process I can, that we have? Yes, I can definitely okay. say okay. that uh, the the uh, exhibition. It took me a full semester to understand what that meant when I first came into High Tech High, and the exhibition component of the course is is so difficult um, to understand how much that motivates students within your classroom. Um, we at Chula Vista, we yearly have this festival, Del Sol, uh, Festival of the Sun, and it's a community-wide exhibition. And it is very powerful um, to have, I mean, so we have like 400 students, uh, yeah, 600 students in the school, and we have about, um, all of them bring family members and have to bring family members to this exhibition. So, you know, yearly we have this, thousand over a thousand people kind of like storm the school <laughs> in this this exhibitable thing and uh, it, it's it's breathtaking um, in, in in it's all around student learning um, in this way that makes makes the education so central it, it says so much about our school to, to be able to see the education come alive in this this uh, central way in, in a way that you don't usually see at a school. Uh, usually the education is kind of an afterthought or, or the, the next thing that you think about. But um, these exhibitions are giant football games, basically. Okay, and so as so we're going to wrap up, and so I'm going to give everybody an opportunity for a, a last word and a thank you to everyone around the world who's been watching. And then Patrick, you're going to describe in uh, very briefly what uh, this is the fourth of seven. What we're doing next Wednesday, right? So people know what the theme is. Okay, so I'm going to go in the order in which I'm seeing you on my screen, uh, which is Dan, Isaac, Lillian, Melissa, and Steve. Okay. All right. Would you all say yeah. <laughs> Sure. So last word here. Um, I would just say I believe it was Tom who was asking about a new school. Um, I suppose the, the only thing I'd say is in terms of the bonanza, the things that really stuck with me that you may want to incorporate with your new school are getting kids involved. So likely the founding team has worked with kids who you can call upon to interview people even if you don't have a school and getting them to, um, getting them to give lessons either in their current environment or just create a classroom, mock that up. And um, this notion of a long length of time, that the bonanza was kind of exhausting and it was hard by the end to not be yourself. So figuring out some way that you can spend a day with people, knowing that if it works out, you'll be spending a year with them. Very good. Thank you. Okay, next. And then I would say um, we at High Tech High entrust very deeply in our teachers. We um, expect them, like one of our core principles is the idea of teacher as designer. So we expect them to be um, curriculum designers, we expect them to be advisors, we expect them to be counselors. We, I think, um, expect them to be um, uh, and challenge them to the point that um, they, if they aren't, if it's not working out, it's be, it becomes very clear very quickly. And so that's what I think is really important is just that we, um, as administrators and as school designers, are giving our teachers the responsibility that they deserve. Very good. Thank you. Next up, Lily. Sure. For me, I think that I think about the words of one of our dear colleagues, Ron Berger at Exhibitionary Learning, who really talks about appealing to that curious learner in every teacher. And I think that going back to that first question about how to help teachers who are transitioning from traditional places into settings like ours, I think it's about reminding them again about what the significant learning experiences have actually been in their own lives and how they can cultivate those for their students by again giving them a chance to step into the shoes of the learners themselves and and re-experience that wonder in the experiences that we cultivate for them as school leaders. Very good. Thank you. Melissa? Uh, Melissa has her volume, her sound off. Muted. Sorry. Oh. Did it again. Okay. I think one of the things I always think about when I'm looking at the people around me that I work with is, is how to create a culturally democratic group of people who work together towards um, really doing what's right for, for kids. Um, and doing that not necessarily from our own perspective, but from a shared vision of understanding each other and where we all come from. So um, I don't know. I guess that's what I've been thinking about sitting here. So. Very good. Thank you. Okay, Steve? All right, Steve, I'm going to wrap up my part in a very touchy-feely kind of way. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think so, so much of this is about just truly loving kids. And I know that sounds, maybe that sounds kind of obvious, but back to the hiring piece, we really need to identify uh, teachers who are there because they truly love kids and want to help kids. Uh, the number one thing that comes up on our uh, biannual surveys, we give uh, anonymous surveys to our students uh, every year at uh, right around winter break and then at the end of the year. And the number one thing that they love about our school is the teachers. And they say that over and over. You know, the best part about this school is the teachers. I was able to connect with the teachers. I'm able to, uh, they're always willing to help me and things like that. And that really resonates uh, with me. So, love the kids. Great. Good. Okay. Thank you. And um, and so, Patrick, so a couple of words about next week. So next week I'm really excited for because we are going to be talking about uh, neighborhood and facility design. And I think these are the two, uh, for me, I, I love the idea of design um, and, and designing things. So we're going to be lo really looking at designing environments and picking where your school will be located within your community that you're designing your school for. Um, also next week I'm going to be introducing the uh, final requirements for the uh, final project that students will be creating and presenting uh, in their exhibition for this new school creation MOOC, so get ready for that. Um, well, you guys, you, the students, will be creating an exhibition of your own, so uh, get ready for those exciting details. Great, and I want to thank you, Dan, Isaac, Lillian, and Alyssa and Steve, who have very very full lives to take yet more time to help us out tonight and help folks from around the world and also Patrick with whom this could not happen, the, the, the magician behind it all and for everyone who's watching tonight thank you so much for your interest and for taking the time uh, to watch and you let other people know that everything that is happening here is archived for the future where that so other people can see the many different videos that have been created and readings and there's a whole lot of other stuff that we don't talk about during these Google Hangouts but are there for people to uh, learn more should they be interested. Thanks everyone and good night. See you next week.